So, I have a lot of dice. Something that I've always wondered about when staring at my enormous pile of dice is how many ways I can roll a given number. For instance, how many ways are there to roll one six-sided die and get one? Well, there's only a single one on the die, so there's only one way we can roll the die and get one. The same goes for two, three, and four, all the way up to six. And as we get to higher totals, I only want to calculate the number of ways using the minimum number of dice possible. For example, if I wanted to find the number of rolls that total to 13, I wouldn't go and try to use 5 dice for that, since I can roll 13 with just 3 dice. An easy way to calculate the number of dice needed is to divide our total by 6 and round up. So with our example for a total of 13, 13 divided by 6 is 2.167. Rounding up, we get 3 dice needed to roll 13. Oh, by the way, these odd brackets are the symbol for the ceiling function, or rounding up. Another thing is that unique orders will all count towards the total. So a roll of 2 then 5 counts, as well as a roll of 5 then 2. But a roll of 6 then 6 would only count once. So what about 7? How many ways are there to roll 7? Well, we can't roll a 7 on a single die, so we'll have to add another die. One way to get a solution is simply by listing die rolls and counting each sum. It so happens that there are 6 ways of rolling this total. For a total of 8, there are 5 ways, and it keeps going like this until we get all the way to a total of 12, with one way to roll this total, 6 and 6. So, in other words, for the more general equation, how many ways are there to roll a given sum using the minimum number of dice? For a total of 13, we'll have to yet again add another die. For 3 dice, our total counts look like this. So, you've been staring at these numbers for a while now, and if you're familiar with combinatorics, they may be looking quite familiar to you. In fact, these values are taken straight from a really interesting structure called Pascal's Triangle. Maybe you've heard of Pascal's Triangle before. Typically, the way it's explained is that you start with a 1 at the very top. Then, you can start filling out the cells of your triangle. Everything outside of the triangle is just 0, and to get a value of a cell, you simply add together the two cells above it, like so. But Pascal's Triangle can actually be defined in a different way, in terms of a combinatorics formula called n choose r often written like this. All n choose r does is calculates the number of ways you can grab r items from a pool of n items where order doesn't matter. Since it's kind of outside the scope of this video, I'll just show you the formula. It's not really important to understand how this works right now, just know that it does. It's a fairly simple formula, except that it uses factorials. Factorials are those exclamation marks, and they essentially denote a product of consecutive numbers up to that number. So 5 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, or 120. These often come in handy when looking at the number of ways to arrange things, and in different problems involving combinatorics. For example, there are 6 ways to grab 2 items from a pool of 4, and 5 ways to grab a single item from a pool of 5. The cool part about all this is that the n choose r values actually can be used to build Pascal's triangle. If we squash the triangle to the left side, we can number the rows and columns like so. Notice that we're starting at the 0th row in 0th column, not the first. With this numbering system in place, we can see that the n in n choose r represents the row, and the r in n choose r represents the column. Since we know that our dice totals line up with Pascal's triangle, and since we know that the n choose r formula lines up with Pascal's triangle, I'd say it's a reasonable leap to say that n choose r somehow lines up with our dice totals. You might find this conclusion a little strange though. After all, what does choosing objects from a group have anything to do with rolling a total with dice? Why would this line up so nicely? I for one don't immediately think of n choose r when I'm rolling dice. Perhaps we need to think about this from a different angle. Now, this may seem a little strange to you, but let's look at a different, related problem. Given a certain number of balls and boxes, how many ways are there to distribute the balls into the boxes? There's not really a formula that's commonly taught to calculate this though, so we'll have to get creative. For the sake of illustration, let's say we're trying to figure out how many ways we can fit 13 balls into 3 boxes. Well, let's do something that may seem a little odd to you. Let's actually add in 2 more balls. Now that we have these extra balls, we can choose any two out of our line to color gold. These golden balls will act as dividers, and we won't actually put them into any of our boxes. Since we added two to our line and we're leaving two behind, it won't affect the total number of balls we put in the boxes. 
but this lets us choose which balls go in which boxes a little more formally. Each choice of two balls to color gold represents a unique configuration of balls in our boxes. And it turns out that we can use our NCR formula here too, since all we're doing is choosing two golden balls out of our line. So in our example, this is 15 choose 2, or 105 combinations. Let's formalize this into a formula. Let's call the total we're trying to get x, and the number of boxes k. Now our formula is just x plus k minus 1, choose k minus 1. So, how does solving this seemingly unrelated balls and boxes problem get us any closer to figuring out the number of ways to roll a specific sum on the minimum number of dice? Well, let's look at our problem in a different way. Instead of looking at all the ways to roll k dice and finding how many of those have our sum x, let's look at how many ways we can put x pips, the little dots on the dice, onto k die faces. And we can do that using the formula we just discussed. However, there are actually more ways to organize these pips than there are ways to actually roll our sum. For example, if we were trying to roll an 8 with two dice, we can put 7 pips on one die and 1 on the other, or 8 pips on one die and 0 on the other. These aren't valid configurations of dice, so we need to refine our model of putting pips on die faces to exclude these invalid configurations from our final count. So, instead of looking at all the ways to put x pips onto k die faces, we instead need to look at all of those ways such that each face has at least one pip and no more than six pips. Let's start with making sure there's at least one pip on each die. We can accomplish this once we've lined up our pips by just putting one pip from our line onto each face. Then we can do what we did before, adding k-1 pips, coloring k-1 pips gold, using the golden pips as separators for the rest of the pips, and then throwing those golden pips out. If we simplify this, we see that we end up removing k pips at the beginning, but then we add all but one back in. This gives us a nice equation of x minus 1, choose k minus 1. Let's look at an example. Say we're finding all of the ways to roll a sum of 5 with 3 dice. Now, for our final problem, this actually isn't something we'd want to calculate, but there's a reason for it. Just stick with me. With this sum, it's pretty easy to just look at all the possibilities. So let's do that, and let's see what configuration of pips and boxes each possibility corresponds to. First, we take 5 pips, and put one onto each die, leaving us with two more. Then we can add two more for our separators. Now let's look at how we can get to five. Firstly, we can roll two twos and a one. But remember, our order of dice matters, so that means there are going to be three unique possibilities, depending on where the one is. Those three are equivalent to these configurations of golden pips. Separately, we can also roll two ones and a three, which also gives us three possibilities. In total, this encompasses six different possibilities, and if we look at our formula, we can see that 4 choose 2 is, in fact, 6. So, it looks like our equation works. But so far, we've only accounted for the minimum number of pips. That worked for our last example, because if any of our dice had over 6 pips, we obviously couldn't have gotten a sum of 5. So, let's look at another example. This time, we'll be trying to roll a sum of 16, again with 3 dice. So let's take our 16 pips, put one on each die, and then add two more to use the separators, leaving us with 15 pips. So if we use our old equation, we have 15 pips and must choose two to color gold, giving us an answer of 15 choose two, or 105 possibilities. Now a lot of these possibilities will have too many pips on a single die. Let's call these dice overloaded, but let's actually go through each one of them to see which ones will and won't work. For these first 14 configurations, the first golden pip will be all the way on the left, which means our first die roll will be a 1, which means we have 13 pips to distribute among two dice, which won't allow us any combinations without overloading. Same with when we have two pips on the first die. Then we'll have 12 to distribute among the two dice, which is equally impossible since we already have one pip on each of these dice. This doesn't become possible until we hit our 40th configuration, when there are finally 10 pips to distribute among our two dice. But we still don't have a working combination yet, as this gives us a 4 on the first die, a 1 on the second, and an 11 on the third. But 5 configurations later, we have a valid combination of 4 on the first die, 6 on the second, and 6 on the third. And 10 configurations after that, we see 5 on the first, 5 on the second, 
and 6 on the third, which is also valid. Then on the very next combination, we get 5, 6, 5, which works too. Later, we ended up getting three more valid configurations of 6, 4, 6, then 6, 5, 5, then 6, 6, 4. After these, every remaining configuration is overloaded. This leaves us with six valid combinations. Now, that was a lot of work iterating through each possibility, so hopefully we won't need to do that again, and hopefully we can use this result to help find a more general way to get our final count. Now let's look back at what we just calculated. We ended up finding six valid configurations for rolling a 16 with three dice, which ended up being the exact same number of configurations we got for rolling a sum of five with three dice. This could be a coincidence, but let's compare our valid combinations to see if there are any similarities. If we line up the solutions like so, and add up the corresponding numbers in each, we end up getting 7 each time. Those of you familiar with how dice work will know that this means that for each of our corresponding values, our first value is the same distance from 1 as the second is from 6. In other words, the number of pips on the first die is equal to the number of pips missing from 7 on the second die. This means that our distribution is symmetric about its center. For example, there's one way to roll both 3 and 18, and three ways to roll both 4 and 17, which means that any number that is a certain distance away from our minimum value of 3 will be able to be rolled in the exact same number of ways as whatever number is equally as far from our maximum value of 18. So it looks like our suspicion is confirmed. If we look back on our earlier solution, we can now find a way to solve it without examining so many configurations. Instead, we could have started by realizing our number of solutions for x equals 16 would be the same as the number for x equals 5. Then we wouldn't need to account for overloading, since we can't overload while still getting a sum of 5. And wouldn't it be great if it just so happened to be that for any number in our equation, we could just take the corresponding smaller number and not need to account for overloads at all? Well, maybe that's the case, and maybe it's not. Let's find out. So under what specific conditions can we avoid accounting for overloads? Well, with our equation so far, the smallest sum possible for a given number of dice where at least one is overloaded will involve a 7 on our first die and a 1 on each of the others. For any number less than our smallest overload, there won't be any possible overloads, and so we won't need to account for them. This means that for a number of dice k, the first number for which we need to account for overloads is 7 plus k minus 1 the 7 representing our 1 overloaded die, and the k-1 representing the value of 1 on the rest of our dice. And, of course, we'll simplify it to k plus 6. This means that, since the smallest number we can possibly roll in the first place is k with all dice landing on 1, the smallest 6 sums for each number are the ones for which we don't need to account for overloads. So going back to our original question, we're reminded that we're trying to roll each sum on the minimum number of dice required to roll that sum. This means that for a given number of dice, anything below the top six sums that can be rolled on that number of dice can also be rolled with fewer dice. This is because each die we add increases our maximum possible roll by six. In other words, in our original problem, we're only concerned with the top six values that can be rolled on each number of dice, and it ends up being the bottom six numbers for which we can ignore overloads. Therefore, with just a slight adjustment, we can solve this problem without needing to account for overloads at all. Here's what we'll do. Instead of asking ourselves for the number of ways to roll x, we should be asking ourselves about a different number. Let's call it x prime. x prime should be the same distance from the center of our distribution as x, so if x is greater than k minus 6, we reflect it about the center to deal with a smaller number. If the number of dice we're rolling is k, which is represented by the formula we derived earlier using the ceiling function, and our minimum value ends up being k, and our maximum value ends up being 6k. Since x and x prime are equidistant from the center, that also means that x prime is as far from k as x is from 6k. To calculate x prime, let's start with k and add the difference between x and 6k. So we can take this equation and plug it into our equation where we ignore overloads. Therefore, our function is equal to x prime minus 1, choose k minus 1. Or, when we put it in terms of x, 7k minus x minus 1, choose k minus 1. So now we have a solution to our original problem. But how does this equation explain the nice pattern we see in Pascal's triangle? Well, let's look at it again. And let's do what we did at the start of the video and squash our triangle over to the left. Now it's still the same structure, but we can see the pattern our function makes much more easily. We have our equation for the number of dice k in terms of x, but it's easier to think of k as our number of dice 
which starts at 1 and increases by 1 each time we pass a multiple of 6. That explains why we're going to the right in Pascal's triangle every time we get a new die. Our bottom number is k minus 1, so we start at 0 all the way on the left, and we move to the right every 6 values. Now let's look at our top number, and we'll start by looking at when x is equal to 6k. This means our top number will be k minus 1, so each time we add a new die, our top number will increase by 1, moving us one row down. Similarly, for 1 less than our top value, we'll get k. For 2 less than our top value, we'll get k plus 1, etc. Meaning that decreasing x by 1 while still rolling the same number of dice moves us one space down. Overall, we weave this pattern through the triangle. So this is it! Using our value for k that we derived earlier, we end up getting 7k minus x minus 1, choose k minus 1. And that ends up producing our neat visual pattern on Pascal's triangle. And let's look at how we did it. We started with a pretty natural question that arose from messing around with dice and thinking about their sums. How many ways, we wondered, could we roll some number x on the smallest possible number of dice? And when we started calculating this total, why did the diagonals of Pascal's triangle emerge? Although this problem at first appeared simple, solving it would require us to learn some combinatorial tools, to look at the problem through creative lenses, and by the end we revealed some really beautiful patterns and symmetries in the seemingly random medium of dice. Let's recall. First, we reframed our problem, realizing that rolling a specific sum on our dice is quite similar to organizing that number of balls into boxes. Then, we figured out how to calculate the number of unique ways to organize balls into boxes, adding extra balls into the equation to use as separators just to remove them later. Next, we had to figure out how to deal with the natural bounds of dice. To make sure each die had at least one pip, we just removed a number of pips equal to our number of dice, placing one on each die. Then, to make sure each die had at most 6 pips, we exploited the convenient fact of our problem that we're only dealing with the top 6 numbers for each number of dice, along with the symmetry of our dice distribution, to instead arrange a smaller number of pips into boxes, such that it became impossible to overload any dice. And then, finally, we saw how our equation lined up with our initial strange observation, lining up with Pascal's triangle. Now, there are a couple follow-up questions we might ask about this problem. The first is, can we generalize this to n-sided dice? That is, this applies to six-sided dice. Does it work for any number of sides? For example, can I use the same formula to find out how many ways there are to roll a 50 on three 20-sided dice? The short answer is yes. If we just replace all our sixes with n's, we can go through the same argument again and get this equation as a general solution. And in this case, there are 66 ways to roll a 50 on three 20-sided dice. Next, we might ask, can we generalize this to rolling any number x on k dice? or even k n-sided dice? The short answer to this is also yes. However, an argument for how to derive this is beyond the scope of this video. For the curious, it uses an iterative method called an alternating sum to count the number of ways k dice can be overloaded, because that's the only way to probe the number of combinations that actually are valid in a more general situation. The final formula for rolling x on k n-sided dice is this. If you're interested, there's a great blog post by Luca Moroni that explains this idea in much more detail. That blog post gave us key insights that we used to solve this problem in the first place, so we highly recommend you check it out. The link to it will be in the description of this video. Thanks for joining us! This was made for 3 Blue 1 Brown Summer of Math Exposition by my friends Flynn Donahoe, Grace Baumgartner, and myself, Milo Jacobs. But it wasn't just us three. Huge thank you to Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown for organizing this competition, and Luca Moroni for writing the blog post we mentioned before, as well as all of the following people for helping us edit. Goodbye!